Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Turnham. I work for APT Associates, and I'm a, a researcher. Um, APT has partnered with the University of Wisconsin um, to do one project under this first year um, Social Security Administration grant. Um, we are really grateful to be involved. Um, the project involved conducting focus groups with um, a variety of low-income people across the country. Between June and September of this year, we conducted 18 focus groups. Um, and the goal of the groups was to understand how people think about savings, uh, money management, financial education, with a sort of a secondary goal of understanding how community-based organizations and nonprofit organizations, which work with a lot of these people, uh, as well as employers might enhance their efforts to provide financial education uh, to low-income and vulnerable populations. So as I mentioned, we have 18 focus groups. There's about 162 people. And most of the focus groups were with clients of one of four uh, community-based organizations. So we had three groups with each of the four. Um, one was a tr tax preparation organization. Uh, one was a job training center focusing on people coming either receiving TANF or coming off TANF. Um, there was a uh, housing counseling agency, and our focus groups were with foreclosure counseling clients. And then there was an agency that um, operated a match savings and IDA program, and our focus group participants were all IDA um, participants. Then we did uh, another six groups that were kind of for comparison with, with slightly different populations. Um, three of them were with employees of a logistics center of a large national retail chain, and so there's a bit of a bigger spread of income there, but I think these were all sort of low to moderate income people. Um, and then we did three groups with people who um, primarily speak Spanish in the home and at work. And those were two groups with different age groups of workers and then one group with small business owners. Um, we supplemented the focus groups by interviewing uh, staff from the four community-based organizations that we partnered with um, to talk to them about what we found and get their impressions um, based on their work with their clients. Just a quick uh, demographics. We, as I said, these were mostly low-income people. We had a, a range of ages in some of the groups. Uh, in some of the sites, we specifically targeted different age groups, but we're really talking about, you know, from early 20s to um, late 60s. Um, we had different races. Most of the groups themselves were fairly homogenous, so we had some that were primarily African-American, some that were primarily white, some that were primarily or exclusively Hispanic. The topics we um, discussed were, you know, how and why people saved, what obstacles they face in savings, and then how they view particular savings opportunities, retirement savings, uh, tax refunds, and IDAs. And then we also asked people about their sources of financial information, um, what kinds of ed financial education they prefer, what formats, and when they think in the life cycle or working with community organizations, financial education might be most effective to get at uh, teachable moments. This just provides an overview of who's saving, with the exception of two groups, the Logistics Center employees and the IDA group, the Savings Match Alliance groups. Those groups were um, saving. Um, the Logistics Center through mostly through their 401k plan and obviously the IDA participants through the IDA program. The other groups, I would say that um, between half, you know, at, le at least half uh, did not, were not actively saving um, and a number of them did not have uh, bank accounts. So we, we talked through a number of the reasons why people have trouble saving and we grouped them into these five categories and I'll just go through briefly uh, what we found on each. So one big issue is, um, is the ability to set savings goals. And in general, with the exception of the IDA groups, who were all about goals, uh, most people did not, you know, there were few mentions of savings goals. Um, there were, and when goals were mentioned, uh, they typically were nonspecific and very short-term goals. Um, some people also had the sense that, you know, you couldn't set a goal until you had some money. So until you started savings, it wasn't possible to set a goal. And just, I'm not going to read all these, but the blue italicized um, our, our quotations directly from the focus group. As I say, the, the exception were the, the match savings um, participants who were very focused on their goals and also saving. Another factor affecting savings were the opportunities that people felt they had to save. And so many, many people in our group, particularly those who are unemployed or underemployed, simply felt that they had insufficient income to save. 
um, there wasn't anything left over. And some people who had saved didn't really have a financial cushion, so they saw their savings being wiped out time and again by crises. And that was kind of frustrating to people and made them, I think, in, in some sense, created a sort of dispiriting sense of, you know, what's the point in doing this? Um, and then uh, some people talked about, you know, f not having access to certain to 401ks or certain investment tools that they thought would be helpful to them for saving. Um, we also, you know, uncovered some gaps in financial knowledge. People talked a lot about how they wish they had learned more as children. They had to learn a lot through experience. These are on things like credit cards, student loans, and then just general, you know, living within your means. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty and lack of knowledge about Social Security, w what's going to happen in the future, how much they need to save for retirement, and then also much confusion about how 401ks work. Uh, and we had a number of, of people who had cashed out or taken loans out and, and sort of not realized what they were doing. In the Spanish language groups, um, language barriers was a, what came up as a big topic. Um, people talked about lacking, there's just a general lack of access to financial information in Spanish, but then also translation issues. And the difficulty of using their children to, do tra to translate, you know, what are quite technical documents. And then uh, another theme was the, you know, just a lack of willpower. Uh, many people sort of understood what they were supposed to be doing, but weren't able to control their spending. And there was a lot of discussion of overspending, uh, particularly on children. And then the tax, the people who wanted, three of our groups were with people who got tax refunds through a tax preparation service, um, and they, they were all selected to be people who were believed to be able to get, you know, refunds based on their income. And those people, that kind of put their willpower to the test, and a number of them reported um, spending the tax refunds on vacations technology or what they would describe as treats. Um, we also, uh, another factor was a, a frustration um, to, with banking institutions um, for fees and penalties, low interest rates, uh, credit unions were believed to be, had a, the people were much more positive about credit unions. Um, there was mistrust and confusion around 401ks, concern with privacy, with putting their information out there, um, and then particular mistrust of, of the banking system among the Spanish speaking groups. So what were people doing who were saving? There was a lot of discussion in every group about um, saving in the penny jar, collecting loose change, bargain shopping, and then very ingenious ways of making money inaccessible to themselves. So opening a bank account somewhere that was a long way from where they lived or didn't have ATMs or had inconvenient hours, it was uh, very creative. People at the Logistics Center group had a lot of trust in their employer, and for those people, the 401k was an important saving tool. And obviously the IDA people were highly motivated and actually said that the training that they had received, they thought they were likely to continue to save after the match ended. Um, and then some people talked about how different life events uh, could motivate greater savings, although in some cases that could also provide disincentives to savings. Uh, we asked a lot about f sources of financial information. I think none of these are that surprising, but you know, family and friends was most common. A lot of people use television and radio. Uh, the internet was interesting. Most people had access at home, and then those that didn't had access through friends or libraries. And people used it a lot to browse for information, but there was a lot of skepticism about the information out there. Um, nonprofit organizations, employers, banks, churches, uh, and then sort of life experience as a source of information. So really there's a full gamut, a uh, wide range of places where people obtained information. In terms of financial education, when we asked them what, what they're interested in for financial education, there was a great eagerness for financial education, particularly on these four topics I have listed here. Um, there was interest in both different formats. There's no one size fits all. Some people like groups, some people like one-on-one. -on -one. They articulated a lot of rationales for why group was better in some cases and one-on-one -on -one in others. There was a lot of interest. We discussed coaching and peer support groups. Um, this is not something that the participants had experience with, but they, they were reacted very enthusiastically um, to. I think because of the longer term engagement that's implied and also the focus on behavioral change. Um, mixed support for financial education packaged with um, this other supportive services such as foreclosure counseling and tax preparation. And little interest in online financial education, which was interesting to us. Um, but also little experience with it. So just to wrap up, I think w some of the implications of this study, and you know, we, it's actually quite exhaustive with all these focus groups, so I'm just touching on the highlights. But 
it appears that for basic savings, um, behavior is a greater impediment um, to our focus groups than a lack of knowledge. So people understand, I think, how to do basic savings or living within their means, but they, are, they have a lot of trouble acting on that knowledge. They were very interested in financial education that focuses on behavior and helping them um, sort of change their behavior around savings and, and spending. But there were strong gaps in knowledge regarding 401ks, um, retirement savings, and that suggests the need for, you know, for longer term savings, it may be that there is a lot of information uh, need still out there. Strong mistrust of financial institutions, and in some cases, employers. So we saw a big difference between the logistics center group, which had a lot of um, trust in their employers, and the, the recent job, the recent employees that had received job training. They are at a different kind of less career-oriented jobs, and they had very little faith in their employers. They said that, you know, my employer doesn't manage the business right. I'm not going to trust him to give me information on my finances, and I don't want to share anything with him. So that that's an, it was an interesting finding. I mentioned the language barriers that persist and the ambivalence toward online education. I think this really um, warrants further um, exploration because I think that some people, people have different experiences with online education and they have a perception of it. They also have concerns about trusting, putting their information out there online. We did hear some support for online gaming, so that, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> but I think that it was, was one of the things that was interesting just on that is that with the younger groups um, who had, had more experience with online education, they described online education as being too easy to blow off. So this is a course that you go through, you go through the motions, and they didn't, you know, believe that they would learn a lot. But I think there are, we know there are online educations out there that are quite rigorous, and so I, I think part of that is a lack of experience with those. Thank you. <laughs>